welcome to Indy Capital. I'm Pamela Nash and this is Robert Epstein and we're going to talk a little bit about his current movie, Adams Morgan. <laughs> Robert, so you're actually doing the festival circuit right now with Adams Morgan, is that correct? That's right. Our producer-writer, Paul DeVoe, has been uh, taking the project around and we've had a couple of really nice showings so far. It debuted in D.C. at the, uh, at the Avalon Theater um, on Mother's Day. And then uh, to keep the holiday thing going, uh, we participated in the East of the River Festival on, um, during Labor Day weekend. And that's a, that was another great project. So, uh, and uh, Paul's continuing to submit that, and uh, we've gotten really good responses to the film when it's been seen by the audiences. I want to talk a little bit about how, how did you get into this project? I've known you in D.C. as a, a Meisner instructor, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But how do you go from training actors to directing them? Well, uh, to me, it was both a natural and a really exciting transition. Uh, one of the things that happens when you're uh, particularly teaching Meisner-based technique, you go for many, many months uh, teaching the actors to follow their own impulses and to absorb the techniques that you're giving them through their own process. So I spent all that time holding back on any directing notes that I have. Basically, I give teaching notes, which is different. Say, well, you know, if you approach it this way, it'll come out a little bit more that way. And you try to, you know, let the actors develop the process because when they leave your studio, you want them to be able to use the technique independently. So to be able to take all of that work with actors and understanding how a scene works, how you get an actor to work effectively in a scene and rehearse the scene, all the steps in doing that, and then to take it onto the set and be able to take the other position and direct the actors with that information in hand, it's very exciting and it really applied very directly. What was it like working with some actors that have not been through Meisner training? That's a really interesting question and I keep telling my students all the time, you're going to be working with other actors who don't work this way and you're going to be working with directors who don't work this way and you have to use your technique to adapt. So there's one piece of Meisner that you can always focus on with anybody. And I had a great cast that Paul and I put together. Paul did a lot of casting, did callbacks, weeded out a lot of the original actors. And then he brought me in for the uh, final callbacks. And I brought in some of my students and some of the actors I knew. And between that group, we came up with a really, really nice dynamic, very enthusiastic cast. And they came from all different backgrounds. We had people who had the Meisner training from me. We had people who had been trained by Synetic uh, Theater who, you know, really worked from a, a physical standpoint, but they also had a very strong overall acting training as well and people from other backgrounds too. And the one aspect of Meisner that I focus on and that I was able to focus on with all of these diverse actors is the idea of really interacting with the other person, paying attention to what you're getting from each other, establishing a relationship and so that your responses to each other are real. Real responses, truthful behavior. And everybody was able to, uh, with a little bit of direction and their own understanding of the scenes, were able to fall into that. You can see in the scenes in Adams Morgan, people are acting in, you know, in their own ways and they have their own backgrounds. But there's a lot of interaction. There's a lot of face-to-face -face, uh, attention. And there's a lot of response that's, you know, small responses, little responses, interesting responses that come from real human beings rather than from actors. And that's the main Meisner principle. And you can apply it as a director even if you don't have Meisner actors. And let's, just for those who aren't familiar, can you just give us a sentence or two about what is the Meisner technique? Sure. Um, Meisner technique uh, is one of the, I would say, there, you know, people may argue that there are four or five, but I'd say three major techniques that come from the three major acting teachers uh, in American, modern American history. And those were Lee Strasberg, Stella Adler, and Sanford Meisner. All three of them were committed to the idea that your acting should be real. They had broken off from the old fashioned tradition of acting out what you were doing and doing kind of theatrical performance. They wanted everything to be based in real human action, real human emotion. But they each had their own approach to that. Uh, without going into a long history, Meisner focused on behavior and working off of the other person. He felt that relationships and how you respond to another human being was the best way to get truthful, full, emotionally authentic acting. And so the whole training in Meisner starts from that premise. You have what's called the repetition exercise, which is known within acting circles, 
where you spend months face to face with another person, just going back and forth, repeating a phrase, then noticing something about the other person's behavior, repeating more phrases, and through that process you learn to respond with specific behavior to every single thing that happens in the relationship. So you get a kind of micro acting where the actors are capable of responding on a dime to this, 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 this at every single moment as they act. That develops into this ability to respond to anything. You start out with the other person, but then you can act truthfully when you're doing an activity. So as an actor alone on stage, you're not frightened to be out there doing something. You really do it and you concentrate on that. And it also responds to how you break down, it also applies to how you break down a script and how you break down character work step by step. So Meisner has a truthful, impulsive, creative process that allows you to find very specific elements of all the phases of an actor's work. And you have been teaching this for 25 years, yeah, is there about? It's, it's even over 25 More than now. 25 years. And I have... I'm afraid to count. <laughs> <laughs> I've spoken to one of your students because I'm very diligent. Mm. And I understand that you have your own kind of expansion of the Meisner technique that is influenced by Eastern philosophy, which is very fascinating. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that's interesting. I, I kind of feel that Meisner, Meisner technique itself has a strong Eastern element. It, it has some, uh, some things in common with uh, certain aspects of Zen, Mahayana Buddhism. And I'm also very interested in, in Zen. I've had an interest in Eastern philosophy for a long time. And the aspect of it that's, that I think they really have in common is this idea of being present, being aware, and taking in exactly what's happening in the moment. Um, to quote the Buddha, he once said that in the scene there should be only the scene, in the herd only the herd, and the thought only the thought. So instead of causing a, a confusing thought process about everything you experience, you kind of hang out with exactly what's happening and find out what's your immediate response to that. And that, in Buddhism and in Eastern philosophy, that puts you in touch with a sense of reality, a sense of presence in the moment that's different than being lost in thought, stuck in your story about who you are, and stuck in a bunch of other stories and concepts about how things work. And instead, you start to see clearly how things actually are, how th people are actually behaving, how people are actually feeling, and who you actually are in the moment, as opposed to your idea about yourself. And by being in the moment that way, whether you're doing it through Meisner or through this kind of Zen, approach of being present in the moment, it allows you as an actor to respond in a clean sort of a way to what's really going on, rather than bringing a whole bunch of, you know, preconceived ideas to what you're going to do as an actor. And I guess that also connects pretty nicely to the idea of improv and a kind of moment-to-moment -moment improvisation. Yes, and I was just going to ask you, that's, we hear the idea of, of Zen and being present as I think people's initial response is, oh, well, then you got to just slow down and relax. But in actuality, that kind of serves you very well if you've got to make something up on the spot. And you had a couple of, of things that happened on the set that you had to just improvise in the kind of, this isn't working out the way we planned, what should we do? So let's talk about... Abs absolutely. And that's, the, that's a, just a, a quick note for that. That's the way that, and, and it is another thing in common that both the Zen tradition and Meisner have in common is that the Meisner actor is actually prepared to deal improvisationally with anything that comes up because they're trained to respond through their impulses to what's happening in the moment. So if something new happens, they incorporate it. That's true in Zen also. The Zen masters are very famous for doing spontaneous things depending on what's going on in a situation and sometimes either frightening or enlightening people depending <laughs> on what's happening. I also throw in there just as a side note that I have a background in jazz improvisation also. So. Another influence on improvisation and creating things in the moment is the fact that I uh, played saxophone and other instruments for many years and explored improvisational jazz. So. That's very interesting because <laughs> within the realm of music, you've really only got eight notes. <laughs> and so you're kind of restricted. And if it's jazz, then you've got certain other elements to the notes. You've got your beat and all that stuff. We're not going to get into music theory. But do you find that restricting or do you find that expanding to have to work within those you know, it's funny, just to, for a quick, a quick note on, on the jazz aspect, and I think it applies to acting really strongly, too. Um, there was a time when, after playing a whole bunch of fast saxophone stuff, I got to a point where I felt like all the notes were the same, and I was just playing up and down the notes and wasn't really creating melody. And I stopped for a while. I stopped playing for about a year. 
And then when I went back to it, I started playing like hearing the notes for the first time and seeing what notes wanted to come after the next notes and playing slower. And it led back to a decent, you know, sort of jazz rhythm and decent speed, but with more understanding of melodic structure. And that can happen in acting too. People sometimes think you just have to improvise like crazy in order to be spontaneous. When in fact, sometimes the best improvisation is waiting and seeing how you respond to something and letting something real happen rather than just jumping all over the place. So let's talk about a couple of examples because we do have some clips from Adams Morgan, the movie. Okay. And the, the music store scene was improvised <laughs> in the way we think of improv. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that was a funny situation. It reflects both improvising the acting as well as improvising the production. And that's, that was one really fun uh, thing about um, the way that Paul and I had to work to get this thing together. Paul was running around like crazy getting locations, and we were scheduling them in whatever order we could and then shooting the scenes in whatever order we had to. And that happens on films a lot. But it was a very uh, tight schedule. We'd get surprised. We're doing this location tomorrow at 10, and we'd have to get all the stuff and go over there. So we were met by surprises as well because we were improvising the schedule like that. And on, uh, on this particular occasion, we were going to do this, uh, this really fun scene with, uh, with Shaz, Shaz Khan, who plays uh, Lance, the rugby player in the film. And he was going to wander into this uh, record store to try to sell his record, co record collection to get enough money to take his uh, girlfriend out on a date. So kind of cute pre premise. And um, we had two actors who were supposed to show up and play um, audiophiles who were coming in to buy records just to kind of set the scene, and neither of them showed up. One of them was really into jazz and was looking for a Thelonious Monk album, and the other one was interested in go-go, the local DC music. And so I jumped in and took the role as an actor, combined both roles into one, and created this kind of eclectic uh, jazz fan who was both into jazz and go-go, and would come in and ask for both things. And it was kind of uh, fun to create this sort of funky uh, character on the fly and then improvise with it a little bit with the... Uh, with the folks who were uh, in the record store. And uh, we, had, we had a lot of fun doing that, and it came out really nicely. And we have the clip. So let's take a look. How's it going? Hey, may I help you? Yeah, Danny Gogo. Huh. Absolutely. Are you looking for anything in particular? Yeah, I'm looking for something by Rare Essence, live at Breezy's Metro Club. Ah, excellent choice. That's the one with the extended Gogo Mickey on it. Uh, it's in the homegrown section. Straight down that aisle right there. Last bin on your left. Okay. And I'm also looking for a little Thelonious Monk. Ah, uh, he's in our icon section. Now, there's some great solo ones, but my favorite is the one with him and John Coltrane. Far left against the wall. John Coltrane. Yeah, yeah, I'll check that out. Down this way. Down there on the left. All right, thank wall. you very much. Okay. If you will excuse me. Yeah, sure, thank sure. Thank you very much. And that's not the only time that that's happened on that particular set of Adams Morgan. Tell, tell us about the flower incident. Oh, I, I, I love what happened with that scene. You know, it's so, so much fun the times that we had to improvise and come up with things. And you know what's funny is that every time we did it, almost every time the scenes came out even better than we would have anticipated. So here's a nice scene where uh, the character played by, uh, by Shaz, Lance, the rugby player, is supposed to be making up to his, his girlfriend, uh, played by Blair Bowers because he didn't show up to her big presentation. and He's, he's going to come and give her roses. Well, the roses didn't show up. We ordered the roses, and then when it was time to shoot the scene, they weren't there. So we looked around, and I saw this old plant that they had in the office building where we were shooting, and I grabbed this scraggly plant, and I said, this is it. And I handed it to Shaz and said, give this to her. Uh, like, you know, this is all I could find or something like that. And he gave it to her, and it was just one of the funniest things uh, in the film. I r really enjoyed that. And I think the way that he handled it behaviorally, too, with a sort of slightly sheepish attitude, giving it to her, uh, came out really well and made for a very fun scene. And we have that clip, so let's take a look at that. How are you, young man? I'm doing fine, Mr. Vernon. Nice to see you. And how many times do I have to tell you you don't have to sign in? Go on up and see your girl. I'll catch you on the way out. Thank you, sir. I'll speak to you soon. Uh, Mr. Roberts is here to see you. Okay. She'll be right with you. You may have a seat. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
Nice to see you, Lance. What a pleasant surprise. Is this for me? How thoughtful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Listen, I'm in the middle of something. Can I call you later? Sure. I just wanted to come by and wish you well on the presentation. It went well. Thanks for asking. I have to go. I'll speak to you soon. You know what I like about that? I, I saw the film at the um, East of the River Film Festival, oh, that's and great. that actually fit in so well with what his character was established. Yeah. Like, if you hadn't told us that, like, you would have thought that's exactly the kind of plant he would have got to. <laughs> he would have <laughs> thought about buying flowers, but he would have got her that plant. It just worked out so well, beautifully. You know, it was just great when that happens. I mean, when you're shooting something, I guess, with the right creative spirit, serendipity. Uh, comes to aid you, and these things pop up that you can't anticipate, and it uh, and turns uh, turns, you know, what could be a difficult situation into a great situation. And then we were talking a little bit about there's that improv, improvise the production, you know, improvise, adapt, and overcome. But then there's the yeah. the kind of the bread and butter of behavioral improv acting, and you've got some very serious moments between some of the characters too. Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit about the. Uh, the brother-sister scene, the, the park bench scene. Yeah, that was Josh Murray, um, who was, uh, did a great job in the film. And, his, and the, the character played by his sister is uh, played by Blair Bowers. And the two of them are uh, having a, a very intimate talk on a park bench. And I love that shot, first thing, the, just the way it worked out. The lighting was beautiful. The framing was beautiful. And it um, was just a really nice uh, scene, the way it was set up. And then the two of them started dealing with each other and talking to each other very intimately about a family situation that was painful. Uh, she wanted him to come to their dad's anniversary, and he started to talk about how he had been abused when he was a, a child and that he hated the dad and wasn't going to show up. And in, in interacting that way, you saw the, the little looks that they gave to each other, the way they interacted as brother and sister, and then there was a point at which, um, you know, they grabbed each other's hands and gave them a squeeze and held hands for a little while. And it was just a, through the interaction and the little behaviors that they exchanged, you could really see that they were brother and sister, that they had this history together, and that they cared about each other. And here, here's the beauty <clears throat> of that type of technique. When we're first introduced to them as brother and sister, it's him leaving this pretty hilarious message on her voicemail yeah. <laughs> machine, or, or on her answering machine, and she's got a huge high pressure, pressure presentation, and he leaves this kind of a joke, relieving kind of message. Yeah. And that's the expectation of the viewers, that's the relationship, and this brother's just a big clown. Yeah. And you've yeah. got to take these actors now to this place of this deep emotional connection and show us that, like, like you said, like they've been through a lot together and they have a bond together. H how do you get them from, you know, the the smart ass joking to the, you know, I'm here for you and... Yeah, that's, that's a really great question and it, it has to do with so many factors that, that are fun to talk about. First of all, you've got really nice actors who, who understand sort of the three dimensions of the character. So even when they're joking around like that and he's leaving her the sort of teasing message before her big presentation, you see her reaction uh, when she's hearing the message just to kind of like give a little sympathetic look and a little bit of a chuckle because she knows that in his way he's supporting her. Mm -hmm. So they're playing. Right. And you, so you see even in that kind of joking relationship there's a kind of closeness that's established there by the way the tone of his voice and the way that she reacts when she hears mm -hmm. the message. And so there's a little bit of a, a foreshadowing there that there's a real relationship there. But they understand the circumstances of scene A and scene B and they know that there's a different kind of situation going on there. So when they get to this really intimate scene where they're talking about their deeper family background and their stronger feelings, they're able to respond to that and go to a different place to deal with a, a deeper aspect of the relationship. And that's good acting. So, work is good? No complaints. You? Things are great. I just brought in some new business, so my boss seemed pretty happy. Excellent. And your love life? <laughs> ah. Nothing. 
I went on a couple dates with this one girl who was too young for me. But that's it. Actually, I just called Audrey up again. Now that I landed this new client, I don't know. I'll be in town a little more, so maybe we can rekindle that. But you didn't invite me down here to talk about me, did you? No, I didn't. <clears throat> did Mom put you up to it? Put me up to what? Asking me if I'll come to Dad's retirement dinner. She might have mentioned it. But I'm asking you to come for me. Nice of you to ask. Pretty sure I'm busy, though. Yeah, right. <sighs> okay, how about I just don't want to go? Why would I choose to spend a moment with the man? The next time I plan on seeing him will be at his funeral. I'll be the one doing the cabbage patch on his grave. Can't you let go? He doesn't carrying around all this anger take a lot of energy and emotion? Sure. But I'd never be able to forgive myself if I forgave him. Gerald, I grew up in the same house. It wasn't that bad, was it? This is the cute little apple of his eye. You could do no wrong. You always got the nicest stuff, most of the attention. Being the firstborn son of an arrogant overachiever, nothing I ever did was good enough for him. It's not like he abused you. No. Just the occasional backhand across the face. You know, to this day, I can't stand the smell of aqua velva. It makes me think of him. I'm not saying he's perfect. Tanya, you're my sister, and I love you dearly. But I'm not going to see him tomorrow, or the next day, or the day after okay. that. Okay. I'm sorry I asked. So busy having that uncomfortable conversation, I forgot to ask. How are things with you and Lance? <laughs> I don't know, Gerald. I don't know. I'm gonna give it one more try tonight. How about that? I enjoyed working with them on, on especially that scene. Uh, we talked about it and and how to how to deal with the intimacy of it and the fact that they were really close and had this history to deal with, and they really had great responses to that. And I, I thought it was an, a very touching scene, especially because my expectations of like, okay, this guy's a clown. Um, <laughs> and for him to have that reveal of that human side was really beautiful. Yeah, I, um, I, I love that scene. And as a little shout out to Paul, he also understood as he dotted the different parts of these relationships mm -hmm. throughout the screenplay, he saw that he really knew the different aspects of the relationship. So if he wrote something, you know, that was kind of fun in the beginning of the film, and then he did something heavier in the middle of the film, you know, he knew what the connections were there in that family background and the relationship between the characters. So it was great to work with. So let's talk about some of your other work. Um, I know we've talked a little bit about your you're a teacher of, of Meisner technique, but this is not the only thing you've directed. You've done some theater also. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and it's been, a, it's been a fun, busy period in, in, uh, in my life in terms of directing. It's a, it really was a jam-packed uh, time. And a kind of funny story about the, the theatrical end of things. Just as we were um, getting involved in the, uh, in, in the shooting of the film and during the months that we did that, which is in the fall of, of 2009, um, we also were working on the rehearsals for a play and I had gotten together with a, a small group of actors and we just decided to produce this thing from scratch from the bottom up and did a production that we produced ourselves um, of Christopher Durang's Beyond Therapy which is an incredibly crazy manic comic play, great crazy play and you have to be willing to be crazy to do it and you also again it's one of those things where you ha get the humor and you get the craziness and the sarcasm but you also have to create real interactions and get the humanity beneath it as well so we did that production and then we wound up uh, figured it was finished it was very hard doing our own production doing everything from scratch but it came off really well in fact we wound up having a crazy performance in the snow 
in, uh, in the winter of uh, 2010, where one of the snowstorms that we had then, and mm -hmm. audience members wandered in through the snow and took their seats, even though nobody could drive, and we didn't think anybody would show up, and we wound up with people in the audience. And then uh, we got the play uh, accepted by, by the Fringe Festival, and we took the whole play and reconstituted it in a new s space, and we did the DC uh, Fringe Festival version of it in DCAC uh, in, in, in the summer of 2010 and got a nice review and had a nice audiences for that and had a lot of fun with it the second time through. And I, just as a side note, I love DCAC. It's my pr favorite black box, my favorite little performing space in DC and I always wanted to do something there. And Beyond Therapy was just the perfect play for that space, very intimate, very sort of dark as a play. Mm -hmm. We had the audience right up on top of us. It's a very interactive play with a lot of little relationships, so that was a lot of fun. And then you've got Adams Morgan, which is now out in festivals. Yeah. And you've got something else coming out that you obviously had to have worked on during that time period. So let's talk a little yeah, bit this about was, that. We, this is actually, um, I am taking the footage from this improvisationally produced film project. Uh, and the, the, the name of the uh, final film is called The Family. Mm -hmm. And it's a collaboration that I did with uh, Christopher Anderson, who's local improv teacher, improv player, uh, improv leader, and film director, independent film director. And plug for Christopher is at IntoTheQuest.com. <laughs> <laughs> and he was uh, studying acting with me for a number of years and picking up Meisner and adding it to his improv mm -hmm. technique. And then after we were sort of in the graduate phase and his group had gone through the whole technique, including my advanced uh, classes, um, which includes cold reading, acting for film and TV, uh, classical training, a whole bunch of other topics with Meisner technique applied to them. We then created this piece. I've always wanted to work with the film technique of Mike Lee, the, the, the British film director. And what he does is he lets the actors improvise to create the screenplay. Then he edits it and gives it back to them, and that becomes their screenplay that they co-created. And then he shoots the film. Well, I sort of shortened the process by just taking the improvised segments. We created a narrative, and we filmed one segment at a time with this family, different family relationships, and assigned each actor a character, which they had to create, and then improvised in character with each other to create the scenes. And so now we have this series of scenes that sort of work their way through the narrative, but there was no script. They're totally improvised. And so I'm now working on collecting those pieces and editing them and turning them into a a final film. Well, we will definitely be looking for the screening <laughs> of that because that is right up my alley with the improv. Oh, that's great. Um, I, I really enjoyed talking to you and meeting you. And the next time you guys see me, DC, I will probably be enrolling in his classes. <laughs> <laughs> for Indie Capital, I'm Pamela Nash, and this has been Robert Epstein.